And thanks, Justin. Good morning, everyone. You made it here. I feel like, I don't know, you guys should get like gold stars or fruit baskets or I don't know, something like that for uh, joining us in the room. So I don't know, maybe we'll have you stand next week and we can shame everyone else. No, um, so, no. I want to say hi to those of you online uh, as well. We are going to dive into that James series that Justin told you about in a little bit. Before uh, we get there, I want to go back to last week. And Justin and Aaron and I were on stage for our New Year's message, and we challenged you to think about and pray about a word for the year that would be inspirational and aspirational from the Lord that would give you guidance and direction for this upcoming year, 2024. And to get kind of some ideas going, we showed a word cloud of possibilities of like what we were looking at. You can see that. Do we have that slide with the, the different words of just, when we talk about a word for the year, what might that look like? And you're like, you know, maybe my word for the year is, is joy. Maybe my word is confidence. Maybe my word is trusting. And not that it has to be limited to here, but this is the whole idea. It doesn't have to be a churchy word or a Bible word. It could be, but not necessarily of just what is an area of growth that, that God wants to do in your life? For Aaron and, and Justin and me, my word was the word disciple, just what that meant for me personally, what it meant for me as a pastor here as well. Uh, for Justin, the word was presence and just being more present with God and present with people. And Aaron's word was fortify, of just the deepening and strengthening of his faith and what God has done. And so if you missed last week, um, it's not too late to jump in to just, again, January is a great time to think about, God, how are you guiding me in the year? And then the other thing we're doing as a church is out in the lobby, we have a couple banners with 2024 written on them. And we're having people, if you've identified your word, to write your word on there. We're not asking for names or anything like that, but we just want to create our own word cloud, so to speak, of how God is speaking to LifeBridge in 2024, that we can use these words as, you know, a way of encouragement and unity and prayer and hope and faith for the upcoming year. So if that's you and you've got your word and you didn't do that before the service, we'd love to have you stop by and do that after the service as well. Just can't wait. You know, I love that we're doing this. Can't wait to see where God's going to take it and take us as a church. So that's last week. Today, like you heard, we're kicking off this brand new series in the New Testament book of James, um, where over the next 10 weeks, we're going to make our way through all five chapters of this book from beginning to end. And some of you might be wondering, 10 weeks, wow, sounds like a lot. Why is this such a, a long series? And you know, it's a good question because, you know, after all, our typical series here is about a month long. So let me answer that question. I want to do it both generally and specifically. Generally about the Bible and more specifically about James. So let me just start with the Bible in general. You know, I think it's valuable. I think it's profitable for us to begin the new year just by engaging with the Bible like this. I really do. And I say that and like I look in the room and I realize we've got all kinds of people from all sorts of background when it comes to your, you know, familiarity with the Bible. And there's kind of this spectrum. Some of you are on like the highly knowledgeable part, and maybe you're on the totally clueless part. And you know what? That's okay. It really is. God meets us right where we are, and wherever you are on that spectrum, I want to tell you that the God who created you, the God who loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you, this God has a word for you. He has a life-giving, faith-inspiring, hope-restoring word from the Bible for you. Why? Because the Bible is not just any book. No, it is the inspired, infallible word of God. It is filled with timeless truths that speak to our hearts in very timeless ways. I love these words. I want to share these with you about the Bible. They're, they're thoughts that come directly from the Bible, and they were put together by the people who um, did the Bible translation called the English Standard Version, and they, they said, hey, how do we want people to think about the Bible the way the Bible speaks of itself? And so there are just these four statements. I want to share them with you as we dive into this. So first, just simply this. The words of the Bible are the very words of God, our creator speaking to us. You just stop and think about how amazing that is. Speaking to us, the creator, right? 
And what about these words? Well, they are completely truthful. They are pure, they are powerful, they are wise, and they are righteous, right? So they're unrivaled, unmatched to anything else ever written, published, posted, or spoken before. The very words of God. And so because of that, we should read these words with reverence and awe and with joy and delight. I love those, those couplets, right? Because they're, they're kind of intention. Like re- reverence and awe is just like so worshipful and joy and delight and so warm, right? And all of that is the attitude of the heart that we should bring to the Bible. And then finally, through these words, God gives us eternal life and daily nourishes our spiritual lives. What is it about the Bible? Well, the Bible, the written word of God, points us to the living word of God, Jesus Christ. And it tells us what it means to know Jesus personally as our Savior, to follow him more fully as our Lord. Because the Bible, as powerful as it is, is not the end. It's the means to the end for us to know God and his son Jesus in our lives, right? So this is why we spend time in the Bible. And if you're newer to LifeBridge, just consider that like an introduction in an orientation to who we are and what we believe about the Bible and why it's so important to us. And if you've been around here for a while, it's not so much an introduction as it is an encouragement. It's an affirmation to our faith that we are building our lives upon the right thing. So that's why we're spending time in the Bible generally. Now the book of James more specifically. Why this book? Why right now? Well, last summer, as I was kind of thinking and praying about where we are as a church, as what's going on in the culture around us, along with just our mission here at LifeBridge, right? To build bridges to life in Christ for every person. The Holy Spirit brought to my mind the book of James. Now, to be honest, you know, we could take anything from the Bible. It would be relevant to our lives. But, you know, there's something about James that I believe speaks both to our high calling as a church and the deep needs that we see around us, right? High calling, deep needs. High calling of us as a church, the deep needs we see around us, right? And James brings this together for us as a church. And to get us into the book, I thought I'd tell you a story. It's a personal story. It's a lighter story. It's a story about me, a story about my wife, a story about one of the most romantic things I've ever done. Now, um, this was easier to tell in the first service because she wasn't in the room at the time, you know. And maybe for some of you to even hear the pastor talk about romance makes you feel a little uncomfortable, so you might want to cover yours for this, all right? Here you go. What was that incredibly romantic thing, dare I say, maybe even steamy thing that I did for Kathy years ago? Well, here it is. Three words. You ready? New kitchen flooring. Yeah, that's right. New kitchen. Are you, is it getting kind of hot in here? Yeah. And I know some of you young bucks are thinking, no, 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 isn't it a nice dinner out, jewelry, candlelight, flowers? And, you know, maybe those gimmicks work early on in a relationship, you know. But for more mature women, they like to hear words like oak. Maple, Pergo, right? It's not that he went to Jared's. No, it's he went to Menard's. Yeah. So way back when, after years and years and years of this grimy old nicked up, curling at the seams, white linoleum floor that showed every speck of dirt and every crumb of food, it was time. Finally time for that new kitchen flooring. But unfortunately, we ran into our problem. A little something called sticker shock. Yeah, sticker shock. Because while the dream was hardwood floors, the budget was saying not so fast. Not so fast. And just when it seemed like all hope was lost, I was introduced to a whole new world. The world of laminate flooring. Flooring that actually looks like wood, feels like wood, holds up like wood, and is cheaper than wood. And I'm talking to this salesman, and he's like, hey, it's, it's less expensive, it's more durable, it's easier to install, less long-term maintenance, and it pretty, looks, pretty much looks the same. And I'm like, well, sign me up, right? Who wouldn't want that? And like, we could go on with the story, but if we were to hop in the car, drive a few hours, go back to that house, walk into the kitchen, you would see this floor. Now, it looks like wood. And it feels like wood. It's held up like wood. Big win for us, right? But here's the thing, in the end, it wasn't wood. 
I wasn't worried. It wasn't the real thing. Now, it was a really good imitation, but it was not the genuine article. And imitations like these aren't just limited to flooring, right? No, we got things like, what, spray tans, fake jewelry, plastic decks, imitation crab with a K, right? powdered coffee creamer, press-on nails, toupees, hair pieces, and other unmentionable fake body parts that you can't see in church, right? Actually, one of my favorite things right about this years ago is something that was called spray-on mud. Spray-on mud. Listen to this description. Spray-on mud is for you to use outside your truck, your Jeep, your SUV, so it looks like you use your expensive toy more than just taking the kids to soccer practice. No, spray it on, and your friends will think that you have just returned from this daring off-road adventure. Spray on mud, right? Now, talk about the appearance of something genuine, right? Yeah, spray on mud. Well, <laughs> all this talk about real and fake, about genuine and imitation, is a long way to kick off our series in the New Testament book of James that we're calling genuine. Genuine. And why are we calling it genuine? Well, the reason we're calling this series genuine is because this is the overall theme of the book and the passion of what it means for us as believers in Jesus Christ to present a, pres possess a real, genuine, authentic Christian faith. Not one that's fake, not one that's imitation, one that counterfeit, but the real thing, the genuine article where people can see from the outside looking in that your faith in Jesus Christ is changing you from the inside out. And think about it. In a time today when trust in the church is at an all-time low, where high-profile Christian leaders keep stepping down in disgrace, where younger adults raised in religious homes are deconstructing their faith, where the outrage of partisan politics is consuming the hearts of believers. To those of us today who call ourselves Christians, James says that Genuine faith isn't simply about saying we believe in Jesus, right? We're reading all the right books, watching all the right shows, listening to all the right music, wearing all the right shirts, posting all the right things. Not that it's bad, but it's just not enough. See, James says the true measure of our Christianity is how we're living out that faith with people in real and practical ways. And living that out not just when times are good, but when times are tough. When things aren't going our way, genuine faith, and you've heard me say this before, right? It's not just that we are able to talk the talk, but we are also walking the walk. Or I like the way James puts this, right? Chapter 2, verse 17. Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Not just fake, dead, he says, right? And so as we go through this series, we're going to be challenged. New Year's challenge, but in a good way, Right? So we honestly wrestle with the authenticity of our faith. Am I, are we Christians both in word and deed, both in what we profess and what we practice, or do we just have some kind of spray on spirituality, laminates Christianity, that might look real on the outside, but on the inside, it's just a fraud. So that's where we're going today. That's where we're going over these next 10 weeks. And to begin, we're going to dive right in, right to the beginning of the passage that Justin read in the first few verses of the book of James. So if you have it open, great. If not, we'll have the slides behind you. James chapter 1, we're going to start right from the top, right? Verse 1. James says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings, greetings. This is the standard opening for like most of the books of the New Testament, the letters, right? Who it's from, who it's to, and a brief word of welcome. Greetings, James says. And what about who is writing it and who's getting it? Well, let's talk about these 12 tribes of dispersion that James is writing to. Who are these people? Well, they're newer Christians, mostly from a Jewish background, and they are scattered or they're dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. Why? Because of persecution from the emperor. And it's this backdrop of persecution, persecution of people who are living out their faith in Jesus that influences a lot of what James says, right? In other words, he is writing to a bunch of Christians who are going through tough times because of their faith. Right? That following Jesus had made their lives harder, not easier, which, by the way, can still be true, especially in other parts of the world. Right? 
That's who he's writing to. But who is this James who's writing this letter? And it's an important question because, like, if you read through the Bible, you read through the New Testament, there are actually two prominent Jameses. Two, not one, right? And sometimes it can be confusing, so let's try to separate who these two Jameses are. First, there's the James who is one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and you read about him a lot in the Gospels. Not only was he one of the 12, he was actually one of the inner circle of three that Jesus kept close to him. There was Peter, and there were these two brothers, the sons of Zebedee, John and his brother, James. So that's one of the Jameses, but that's not the James who wrote the book of James. No, the other one who wrote the book of James is somebody we read about in the book of Acts. Right, so this is the history of the early church after Jesus died, rose, and ascended back into heaven. And we read about this James who's an early church leader situated in Jerusalem. But you know what's even more wild about this James is that James is actually the younger brother of Jesus Christ himself. Wow. Younger brother of Jesus. Mary was his mom too. They grew up together in Nazareth. And think about that. Think about the pressure of having an older brother like that, right? You ever been in school like you're following your, your siblings and they're like, Davis, you're related to them, right? I mean, that's like James is living up to that. What's that sibling rivalry look like to be the younger brother of Jesus? Well, it's interesting, right? Because years later, this is after Jesus died and rose again. This is after Pentecost happened and the church began. About a decade later, later, James is writing this book. And James has a different take on his older brother and how they relate to each other, right? Look at this again, James 1, verse 1. James, how does he identify himself? He says, I'm a servant of God and I'm a servant of my older brother. (laughs) I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now he is viewing this Jesus that he grew up with, probably shared a room with, right? Not just as a blood brother, but also as his forever Lord. Imagine that transformation. And why was that? Because James saw the life that Jesus lived. He heard the truth that Jesus taught. He witnessed the miracles that Jesus performed. And more importantly, he experienced the salvation that Jesus won through his death and resurrection. So James now sees his brother very differently. And I was thinking about this, right? Because like families, we can be weird with each other. And families can often be our biggest skeptics, our harshest critics. Why? Because they see it all. (laughs) They see how we act in public and they know who we are in private. James had a front row seat to his brother all his life. He would have seen, right, the slip-ups. He would have seen the inconsistencies. Yet in the end, Jesus won James over. Why? Why? because Jesus really was who he said he was. Jesus was 100% authenticity, 0% hypocrisy. And you know how different, and you know how refreshing that was compared to the rest of the religious community back then? And see, I think this is why James is so passionate about genuine faith, about Christians living out what they say they believe. Why? Because James saw the real thing up close and personal, and it changed his life forever. And because he did, he called himself a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. By that way, servant, right, that word servant, it's not just limited to Jesus. No, it's also for us. Following Jesus isn't a half-hearted hobby, it's a whole-hearted endeavor. We're called to be servants, not spectators. Why? Because Jesus is our Lord, our Lord. And I think for some of us, that's the question we've got to wrestle with today before we go any further. Can I honestly say Jesus is my Lord and I am his servant? And if not, then what's the changes that I have to make this week, this month, this year? Because it all revolves around this genuine Christianity, genuine faith starts with who I am to Jesus and who is Jesus to me. For James, it's this Jesus, this Jesus I grew up with, the one who died on the cross, rose from the dead, who is not just the Son of Man, but also the Son of God. He's my Lord, and I am his servant. Wow. I told you this would be challenging. We're not even out of the first verse yet, right? Let's go on. Let's see what James wants to address first. After the greeting, when it comes to genuine faith. Verse uh, 2, chapter 1. 
Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. My brothers, my sisters, those of you who are part of the family of faith, when you meet various trials, count it all joy. You know, on the surface, i got to tell you, this has got to be one of the most puzzling verses in the Bible. On the surface. I mean, think about it. The bliss of joy and the pain of trials. How do those two go together? doesn't make sense in my mind. No, if I'm writing this verse, my ins- instinct would be to be like, count it all joy when things are easy, when life is good, when I got my health, when there's money in the bank, when everyone's getting along, right? Count it all joy on sunny days, not icy roads, right? <laughs> but that's not real life, is it? No, at least not all the time. Certainly wasn't the case for these followers of Jesus who were experiencing trials of various kinds, which, by the way, I love that expression because it reminds us that trials come in all shapes and sizes. And what you need to know about that is, you know, sometimes we dismiss what we're going through because it doesn't feel as major or devastating as what somebody else is going through. But you need to know it doesn't mean it's unimportant to God. No, whatever it is, count it all joy. Count it all joy, that needs to be our perspective. See, this is what this verse is all about. It's about perspective. It's about God's perspective. It's about viewing our trials differently. See, what's the difference between Christians and non-Christians? It's not that it's what God spares us from. No, it's about how he sees us through. It's not what he spares us from. It's what, how he sees us through. That's why James doesn't say, if you meet trials of various kinds. He says, when you meet trials of various kinds. And when you do, I want you to count it all joy, which leads us to the obvious question, why? Why in the world would we do that when it feels like our life's been turned upside down? Verse 3, here's why, James says. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That when we go through trials, our faith is being tested in ways like nothing else. See, the joy isn't about what trials do to us. (laughs) No, it's through what trials can do for us. Right? It's not to lessen the severity of how hard things are, right? What trials do to us. But it is the potential of what trials can do for us as we trust God and follow Jesus. Because here's the thing, James says, when you go through trials, when your faith gets tested, they can produce in you this incredible, incredible character quality called steadfastness. And it does so, it happens in a way that ease and comfort can never do. Steadfastness, other translations say perseverance, endurance, right? The word literally means to remain under. And so picture yourself lifting like these heavy weights, right? And holding them up for a long, long time, right? You're getting better, you're getting stronger. That's steadfastness. And that's what God wants to build into our lives. Why a spiritual steadfastness so that we can stand strong under the weight of crushing trials, The spiritual steadfastness grows in us. Look what happens. And let, James says, steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is the joy. It's who we're becoming. See, God is more concerned about your growth than he is about your comfort. God cares more about your maturity than he does about your prosperity. I mean, that's what these words here are all about, perfect and complete spiritual maturity, you and I becoming more and more like Jesus. Where this lacking nothing in the end has nothing to do with our bank account, has everything to do with our character and the kind of person God is making us to be and who he wants us to become. The process of growth that happens, that steadfast, steadfastness produces in us, right, as of trials. That's a lot to take in, so let's bring this together. Why do we count it all joy? Here's what I would say. We count it all joy in our trials, not because they're easy, right? That's pretending. That's fake. We don't want that. Not because they're easy, because they're necessary. And they're necessary to grow us as genuine Christians like nothing else can. Worship is great. Bible study is great. Fellowship is great. Friendship is great. Prayer meetings are great. But there's something about going through trials by the grace of God and prayers and help of others that grow us in ways like nothing else can. Trials that we go through, they're never going to be pleasant in the moment, 
Okay, they're not. Let's not, let's not deny it, right? Let's not pretend. But they can be profitable over time. Profitable over time. We're desperately trusting in Jesus in ways that, you know, sometimes in ease and good times, we're like, yeah, I got this, right? But in trials, we're clinging to Jesus, believing, right? That he's producing something in us, spiritual steadfast, that's going to make us stronger in our faith. See, this is where the joy comes from. So count out all joy, my dear brothers, my dear sisters in Christ, when you meet trials of various kinds. See, this perspective on trials is one of the hallmarks of what it means to have genuine faith in Jesus. And while I realize that's a lot for one side, yeah, we could stop right there, but before we do, I'm going to go on with a few more verses about how we go through trials as Christians, because perspective about the destination is one thing, but wisdom for the journey is another, right? As I go through this, you know, I'm, I'm having faith that God's doing a work in me that I can't see at the time. But as we go through it, we need wisdom for the journey. In other words, how do we make it? How do we know what God wants us to do when we're going through trials? Well, that very wisdom is what James talks about next, verse 5. He says, so if any of you lacks wisdom as you're going through trials, let him ask God. Ask for that wisdom. And what do we know about God? This God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. See, the wisdom that James is talking about here is wisdom to see our lives, our circumstances, our trials as God sees them and responding obediently then to that wisdom that he reveals to us. I think there's a natural instinct to us. The wisdom we want is the wisdom of why. God, why has this happened to me, right? We all have that curiosity. But the, James, the wisdom James is talking about here is not the wisdom of why, it's the wisdom of how. Lord, how do you want me to go through this? I'm lacking wisdom. Would you give it to me? Because I'm not sure I can make it another day. And what I love what this says about God and what it says about us, right? That when you and I go through trials, we're not alone. We're not, we don't have to figure it all out on our own, even though that's my natural tendency, right? You know you what James says? He goes, if you're going through it, ask, ask God for wisdom for your trials, right? And what does it say about God? He's stingy, he's clueless. No, he's extremely generous. And he gives without finding, without any reproach, without any kind of shame, without any disapproval, right? That there is this God who's just waiting to bestow this wisdom upon us if we ask. I mean, if you're in the middle of it right now, you're going through something, you have no idea what to do, where to turn. You need wisdom from God to take your next step. How, where, when, who? So you can just keep going on. There's this invitation to pray. And I think James, you know, he might have got this from his older brother, right? His Lord, what did he say? Ask, and it'll be given to you, right? So James says, ask, and it will be given to you. However, there's a qualification. There's an asterisk, verse 6. But if you're going to ask, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. What a great word picture for living in South Haven, right? The winter fury of Lake Michigan, the violent storms, the crashing waves. Right? Let him ask in faith without doubting. Why? Because what does doubting do? We, we go back and forth like the waves of the sea, right? Actually, this word for doubt here uh, literally means to dispute, and I like that because you can kind of picture like right inside of you, there's a little like debate going on. Do I believe? Do I not believe? Do I trust? Do I not trust? And James is saying doubting is that untrusting part of us that's trying to talk us out of faith. It's like we see with the serpent back in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve. They knew what God said, but they're like, the serpent's like, did God really say? Does God really have your best in mind? We begin to doubt can God, will God do what he says? Can we trust in him? Can we trust in his promises, right? And James goes on, the doubter, what? What's a doubter like? Verse 7, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, right? He is a double-minded man, right? Unstable in all his ways. Not single focus, but double-minded. Again, this back-and-forthness debate that can go on inside of us erodes our faith. If we're lacking wisdom that we need to go through trials, it's not that God's withholding it. 
Rather, we're either not asking him for it, or we're not really trusting him to give it, or we're not acting on it once he gives it, right? Doubts can be devastating to our faith. It really can. So when we ask, we ask in faith. But let me say this about doubt. The place of doubt in the life of a believer, and then we'll close. There can be such a thing as healthy doubt. There really can in the life of a Christian. It's the kind of doubt that makes us question not God, but our assumptions about God. Assumptions that we might have picked up growing up in certain environments. Um, assumptions that we might have made through our own life experiences. Uh, uh, assumptions that we might have made um, through different sources. It's the kind of doubt where we question these faulty assumptions then from our past. We doubt them in light of the life-giving truth of the gospel so that it can lead us to greater intimacy with Jesus. Again, it's not that we're doubting God, it's that we're doubting our caricature of God, our misconception of God. That's why like, when I talk to people, I said, it's okay to have questions, it's okay to not have all the, right, all the answers, but just make sure you're questioning the right thing because not all doubt is spiritually healthy. And doubt run amok can really be hazardous to our faith. So there is a careful path that we need to walk when it comes to doubt. So it's not that we're supposed to be doubt-free, but we need to be careful of becoming doubt-dominant, right? Sometimes we swing the pendulum so far from a naive faith to just questioning everything, including God himself. That's unhealthy, too. No, when, when we ask, we ask in faith with no doubting, no doubting of what we know God to be and what he wants us to do because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind this double-minded man right wisdom for the journey and then like i said before boy there's so much more we could cover there's even other parts of this passage we weren't able to get to today but you know as i think about trials as i think about what people go through what i think about you're going through i want to close this message with just a couple questions okay This is for all of us. Where do you need God's perspective of joy in your trials? That's the first part, right, of what we read. And where do you need God's provision of wisdom in your asking? God's perspective, God's provision. One is about the destination, the other is about the journey. One is about who who you're becoming in Christ, the other is about how you're going to get there. All the while knowing that you're not alone. And God is with you, he is for you, not against you. And again, like this perspective, it's not what the trial is doing to you. Let's just be honest that trials can be hard. No, the joy is about what the trial can do for you. Build spiritual steadfast in you. Grow you as a genuine Christian like nothing else. That's why we count it all joy. That our God is able to take something hard and turn it into something good for your good and for our glory. This is the work of of God. And then as you're going through the trial, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, relational, financial, whatever, trials of various kinds, God promises to give you wisdom. Wisdom to navigate through your latest hardship, right? Wisdom to know what to do. Wisdom to know where to go, who to trust, when to act, and when to wait. So go ahead and ask in prayer. The invitation is open and God wants to give it to you, but when you ask, ask in faith, believing, not doubting, that God is going to give you the wisdom you need when you need it. God's perspective, God's provision. And so that in mind, we're going to close in prayer. We're going to pray together, and I especially want to pray for some of you who are really in the thick of it right now. Trials of various kinds. You're in the trials of very extreme kinds. And if you're not there, then, then maybe God is going to bring someone else to mind in your life that you just want to pray for right now, right? Because genuine faith is also about supporting, encouraging, and praying for others who are going through difficult times, right? This is what it means to be followers of Jesus. So let's pray together. Bow your heads with me. And I'm just going to ask this. Like, if you're comfortable um, doing this, I want you to put your hands in your lap with your palms facing up. Hands in your lap, palms facing up. And and to me, this is just... um, It's kind of a symbol of just being open to God, a symbol of receiving, a symbol of trusting, a symbol of having faith, not doubt, that this generous God is going to give us the wisdom we need. 
I'm going to bring the joy through the trials. Um, tight fists or self-reliance, open hands, wholehearted trust. And so, Lord, we come. We come grateful for who you are, Jesus, all that you've done for us, for your love, for your forgiveness, for your mercy, for your grace, for the gift of eternal life and that we don't ever want to take for granted. And Lord, sometimes when we're on the mountaintop, it's so easy to see that, to feel that, to believe that, but we're not always on the mountaintop. Sometimes we're in the valley bottom, sometimes we're in the desert, sometimes we're in the flat plains. Sometimes we're in the icy terrain where it's just like, Lord, what is going on? I don't understand my life. I don't understand why this is happening to me. And so you tell us, not if, but when you meet trials of various kinds, right? We're supposed to count it all joy. And so, Lord, maybe the feelings aren't there, but we're going to choose to do that today. We're going to choose to believe that you are working for our good, even though we can't see it or feel it in the moment. Thank you that you have grace for us, too, and wisdom as we go through something like this. Loving wisdom from our Heavenly Father, who sees all, knows all, and has our best in mind. Lord, I know even just talking to people after the first service, Lord, and some of these words from you really speak home to what some might be going through. And so, Lord, would they just, Lord, would people here in the midst of some very thick trials know your peace and your grace and your wisdom and glimpses of joy? And then, Lord, we come on behalf of others, people we might know in our family, our friend circle, part of this church family who are going through the thick of it, right? People at work, I don't know. People we go to school with. People in our heart, we want to lift them up. We pray for them as they're going through it, that it would either draw them to you or draw them closer to you, Lord, right? Just because of what you're doing. And Father, we're praying this because we believe. We believe in a generous and a wise God who gives us what we need when we need it and who cares for us so intensely. And if there's any doubt, Lord, may it be the right kind of doubt. Not doubting you and who you are, but doubting those false assumptions that probably need to be taken out of our lives as well. So, Lord, we come, we believe, we trust. Why? Because we love you, Jesus. And it's our heart that we really do want to become more genuine for our good and for your glory. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen.